Hi, I'm Annette Sampson and with me today to talk about financial planning for people working in the public sector is Nerida Cole, the Managing Director for Financial Advice with Dixon Advisory. Nerida, I guess one of the things that I've really noticed recently is that careers in the public sector have changed dramatically over recent years and become a lot more flexible in the old job for life. How has that affected the way public sector employees need to think about their money? Uh, Annette, you're, you're spot on. Um, in the public service as well as the private sector, we're seeing people want more flexibility with their careers. And for public sector employees, that might mean that rather than the traditional lifetime in the public service, that perhaps they take a job from Commonwealth Public Service and as well as a, a state public service position at some later stage and it's not uncommon for people to also uh, be interested in taking an NGO position or working in another type of um, agency outside of the public service to un develop a broader understanding of policy and uh, issues in, 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 the, uh, in, in Australia. And is that as simple as a private sector employee changing their job? It can be, but for people that are members of Commonwealth Super Defined Benefit Funds in particular, it's a lot more complicated. But generally, the uh, remuneration policies and employment policies within the public service are, are quite flexible and generous. And there's also aspects to consider with that, apart from your superannuation, uh, when you're comparing other employment opportunities. So this superannuation, particularly I would imagine with the defined benefit funds, which a lot of people are still in, are they in a way a bit of a golden handcuff that limit your potential to move? Um, well, they don't have to be a golden handcuff, but they're certainly important to understand because for some people, the benefits within those schemes are significant and if they leave the public service as a and are not a contributing member to that defined benefit scheme prior to their planned retirement date, then they can have a significant financial impact um, to, to the negative to their situation. Other people might have a little bit more flexibility because perhaps they've gotten uh, you know, very close to their planned retirement date anyway, and uh, you know, the, the change to private sector for two years just before they're going to retire makes little difference and that will depend on, on that particular person. Um, and for other people that are employed uh, more recently in the public service and are members of the newer scheme, the Public Sector um, Accumulation Plan, the PSSAP, they are just like private sector employer, employees uh, that have um, a super account that, that grows purely on their contributions and the underlying earnings um, from that investment choice that they've made and they're not as uh, complicated as the defined benefit schemes which have rules which determine someone's final benefit um, around uh, based on their service period, uh, their salary and their contributions to that scheme and, and it's a set rule around what they will get at the end. I guess it's not just super that's different as well. I understand the public sector has much more generous things like leave entitlements. That's right. So the public sector tends to lead the way in terms of flexible work arrangements as well as leave provisions. And so that's certainly something that people should consider against their own personal situation and need um, when they're looking at alternative employment arrangements as well. So what will that new employer be able to offer them? and will that allow them to work in a way that helps them to, to, to do the job that they want to do while meeting their other family commitments. And that's something to have a little bit of a look into the future um, at as well because you might not at this point feel that you need a lot of flexibility but it can make significant differences later or at other stages of your career if your personal situation changes and you do need that flexibility which might be to care for a family member or you want to take some time to do some additional study or you want to take some time out to plan what your next next career change is. I guess that's something that you need to be planning well in advance. I guess financially, um, when you're looking at future career moves, maybe time out of the workforce or working for an NGO, how do you prepare for that now so that you've got the flexibility to do those things when you want to? It's really about um, putting in place steps now to get your finances in as strong a position as you can. And that's, that's always difficult. It's balancing your short-term commitments with what you know your long-term goals are, as well as what your long-term considerations might be. 
and that can be hard when you know perhaps we traditionally only think about oh we need to put some money in for our super for retirement but there can be a lot of things along the way that come up that people need flexibility to um, to, to accommodate for uh, and that might be uh, you know school fees for the kids or assisting the kids with you know, even university costs and, and these days getting into the home market as well with, with you know, some assistance for deposits and, and that, it's very expensive. Um, and these goals are often, you know, things that, that make our, our lives rich, um, but if we don't plan um, in advance and, and try and get our finances as stable as possible, then it can be really hard to do these things. And then later in your career, you might feel that you're locked into a um, job because you need that salary and then that's where you don't have the choices to work part-time, to do some additional study, to do an NGO secondment or something like that because you, you feel that you, you, you need that income coming in. If we can get our finances in a, a really as stable as position as possible then that's where we have the choices to, to look at what is important for your situation and your family situation. I guess not wanting to be sexist here, but with increasingly women taking over as the major breadwinner within a family, mm. are these more of a becoming more of a concern? It's um, it's becoming, I, I'd say, more talked about um, because what we know is that women will often um, plan around helping others first and not necessarily consider um, other traditional financial goals like building an investment portfolio or having X dollars in super, their goals will be more linked to helping a family member um, go to university or helping the kids get into that first home or, or you know, making sure the kids are all right before they look at whether I need to have X dollars in super. And, and so it's really understanding what having a stable financial position allows people to do and helps them to see that, well, if I have a stable financial position myself, that doesn't exclude me from helping the family or helping my kids or, or doing something different. It actually gives me the, the, the power to do that and know that I can do that without putting myself in a, in a stressful position. So that might be that we're, we're simply, you know, directing um, all of our surplus in a considered way towards the mortgage, um, maximising our defined benefit super scheme and understanding where that would put us in five years or 10 years or 15 years so that we can have a goal in mind and, and then understand the implications of going part-time, um, giving $20,000 to the kids for something or other um, and understanding how that impacts on, on our financial plans where that means I need to work another year longer or five years longer to then replace that money. Uh, those are the sort of considerations that can help people make an informed decision and then um, have the, 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 the control around what they want to do with their career as well as what they want to do with their finances. If I could just bring it back to super for a moment. Um, given that it is such a huge part of public sector remuneration, and it is quite different. Does that mean a lot of the old rules that apply to super for the rest of us, like maximising your tax deductible contributions and consolidating accounts, did that still apply or does it need to be looked at differently? Contributions to superannuation is, is um, uh, from a building superannuation point of view, is, is generally done via concessional contributions and what we call the you know, salary sacrifice, where you divert some of your salary into superannuation and will only pay the 15% super tax instead of your marginal rate of tax. Now, um, the maximum concessional contribution that people can do these days is $30,000 or $35,000 a year, depending on, on your age. And that has to take account of what your employer is putting into the super as well. So that's normally the 9.5%. Now, for public servants, they've got a couple of little extra things to check. So if they're a public sector, accumulation plan member, then they may be having 15.4% go into their super and that might use up a, a big chunk of their contributions. If they're a defined benefit scheme member, however, they're likely to only have 2 to 3% of their salary counted towards that limit. So it actually gives them quite a big advantage in that they may, in fact they're likely, to 
to be able to make quite a big uh, salary sacrifice contribution to help build their superannuation in addition to their defined benefit scheme. But the catch is they can't make those salary sacrifice contributions into their CSS or PSS defined, ben be defined benefit scheme. They will have to open a new account, a separate um, uh, accumulation style fund and make those salary sacrifice or concessional contributions into that scheme and that's just because the CSS and PSS have these defined rules, they can't um, accommodate the extra concessional contributions going in there. The other part for defined benefit schemes to, to remember is that they are likely to be putting some money into the CSS and PSS but don't get confused with that, those contributions will be non-concessional member contributions and they're traditionally about 5 or 10 percent. So that's a different bucket, has a different limit and they'll need to be um, conscious of that if they plan on making you know, other types of non-concessional contributions and, and be very aware of those limits but it is a different limit to the concessional salary sacrifice limit. It's quite a bit to think about there. If we could just finish off with one quick question, Nerida. If you had one piece of advice for someone in the mid-career in the public sector, what would it be? It would definitely be to make sure they understand their superannuation, particularly if it is a defined benefit scheme. Those schemes are so valuable that if we're maximising our membership um, benefit from that scheme, we're really giving ourselves such a strong um, safety net into retirement and then we can make informed decisions about whether we want to change to private sector, NGO, take some leave to study, um, that we can do that without significantly impacting on our financial position in retirement. Thank you Nerida, that's been really useful. I think there's a lot there to think about in terms of planning ahead and how being on top of your finances and giving them a little bit of thought now can really give you a lot more flexibility with both your career and your lifestyle in future. Thank you for watching.